and I appreciate each and every one of you coming. It's a big thing to us to see you here tonight. Thank you very much indeed for coming. May God bless you for being here. Now, um, what has happened is they have uh, been stuck with me tonight because everybody's away on cruises and everything else. So when that happens, I start to realize the finger of suspicion points at you. And so what I do is I get before the Lord and I say, now, Lord, you're the only one who knows who's going to be there this evening. And uh, please tell me what you want to say to them. If I miss the mark, uh, it's because I haven't heard your voice. And uh, so the Lord has pointed me, I believe, to Luke chapter 9. If you have your Bible with you, perhaps you could turn to Luke chapter 9. And these first verses that I'm reading are not actually the ones that I'm going to preach from, but you'll, can see, you'll see later that they are important and they do relate to what uh, I will be saying later. So it's Luke chapter 9 and verse 28 to 31, first of all. And while you're turning to it again, you're, you're more than appreciated, believe me. And thank you, Francis, for playing uh, the organ as uh, Elsie's away in Aberdeen. And it's great to have Addie with us here tonight, a man that served the Lord for 20 years in Africa. And uh, we really appreciate Addie being here. Now, it's verse 28 of Luke chapter 9, please. And it says here, and you'll allow me, I hope, to interject what we're reading with little thoughts that the Lord has given to me uh, as I was reading this in private before him. And uh, we're just taking a quick glance here at these verses. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, Jesus took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Now, we call this the Mount of Transfiguration. I'm sure you've heard of that. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His facial features were changed. Do you see that? And his raiment was white and glistering. And another translation says, white and dazzling like a lightning flash. So you can see his deity shining through the veil of his flesh here. You can see this is a night scene. The whole area has been lit up. He's on top of the mount there. And uh, you can see that, behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, that's just the Greek way of saying Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease. Now, the word there for decease means his exodus, his departure, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. You see, he was going to accomplish something by dying at Jerusalem. Can you see that? The agonizing, sacrificial death of our loving Savior and Lord Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the divine purpose of Almighty God for sending him into this world in the first place. The entire work of redemption was going to be completed. He was going to cry, it's finished. Do you know what that word means that's used there, finished? They actually used to stamp it on taxation that had been paid, they would give a receipt saying, paid in full. Hallelujah. See, that's what the Lord was doing at Calvary. He was paying our debt in full. Now, notice that death is not the end of human existence, but only a departure from one place to another. And when we get to heaven, you know, it'll take a moment or two to pick each other out in our new garments from the shining crowd of the redeemed that we'll be standing with. Now, what we're reading here, dear unsaved one, some of my comments, by the way, will be to believers, so I don't expect you to understand everything, but don't worry about that. You'll, you'll pick up those things that are for you. And what we're reading about here in these verses actually happened historically, close on 2,000 years from where we are tonight. Now, have you got that in your mind? 2,000 years ago, this is what happened. And this isn't only a historical record. 
This is a divinely inspired living book. This is a spiritual book. This is a life-changing book. But I want you to realize, if you'll come back 2,000 years with me, that Moses at that time, at that time, had passed away 1,500 years beforehand. Now, have you got that? So that's 3,500 years ago he died, and God buried him. And Elijah had ministered 850 years before that moment on the mount that day. And of course, we know that God raptured him. Now, notice they're not mummies in a museum. They're fully alive and they're talking to one another. You see, and even the disciples, Peter, James, and John, they can recognize. People say to me, will we recognize one another in heaven? Of course we will. Will we be able to talk to the Lord Jesus? Of course. Can't you talk to him down here? Do you think you'll not be able to talk to him up there? Yes, of course. And we're excited about our salvation because it's wonderful. You see, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Our Lord Jesus Christ taught us that. He says, God says, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He didn't say I was before they died. Now, these two witnesses are representative of the law and the prophets which look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ and the whole work and wonder of his being. You see, I was thinking of how that this might be a wonderful thing to you to realize that he's standing 2,000 years ago talking to these two great personalities, Moses and Elijah, personalities that came from different parts of history. But friend, let me open your spiritual eyes for a moment to see that the blessed Redeemer that they're talking to is the Ancient of Days who created the entire universe. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So if you think it's wonderful that he's having the privilege of talking to them, let me tell you, Peter slipped for a moment, and he said, Lord, let's build three tabernacles, one for Moses, Elijah, and one for you. And God broke in and spoke from heaven itself, from the excellent glory, and he said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. You see, you can't bring him down just uh, to the mere level of mighty giants like like Moses and Elijah, no, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Now, I can't spend so long on these things, so I'll have to press on. But our precious Savior at this time is on the homeward stretch of his public earthly ministry as he's journeying to Jerusalem. His concluding ministry there in Jerusalem and in the surrounding provinces will continue for about three months and then he will eventually go to the old, blood, the old blood-soaked rugged cross at Calvary to bear away our sins substitutionally and sacrificially in his own body on the God-forsaken tree. See, those sound like big words, but you footballers use that word substitution. You, you know, you say they're sitting on a substitute, and you know who that is and what that is. Somebody's broke their ankle or something. So they're sitting on a, a substance. Our Lord was our substitutional sacrifice and sin bearer on the old blood-soaked rugged cross at Calvary. And he's going to die physically. He'll be buried. And after three days, he'll rise again from the dead. He'll ascend near Bethany up into heaven on the Mount of Olives as, as their necks get stiff and they watch him being received out of their sight, levitating back into heaven without the aid of booster rockets or anything else. And here he's back in heaven and God exalts him and sets him down at his right hand, exalting him far above all. Now we're going to verse 51. And this is the, the, this is the bit where God was speaking to me about this meeting tonight. And so you'll see why I've read those other verses uh, in a moment or two. Verse 51 of the same chapter. And it came to pass when the time was come. Now, the timing of the event, 
that is in view here is clearly recorded for us once again. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. Now what does that mean? That means when the time had come for him to ascend back up into heaven again from whence he came via the old blood-soaked rugged cross and his glorious resurrection from the dead. The time had come for that. It says here, he steadfastly. So we see his ascension, but now we see his determination. He steadfastly set his face. You see, this is his compulsion of heart. His face exposed his resolve to do what he was going to do. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. You see, Isaiah the prophet prophesied of this moment 700 years before it happened. This is what's amazing. I'm telling you this because it's staggering. There's no other book like the Bible. No other book that's divine. We were teaching the Bible class today of, of, of uh, Job's discoveries, and I better not get into that. And we saw the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures and how that these men couldn't have known the things that they knew if it hadn't been uh, for the Holy Spirit revealing the earth was hanging upon nothing. <laughs> they didn't believe that until the astronauts saw it for themselves from the moon. No sky hooks, nothing else. Now, let me just say this, that Isaiah said 700 years before that happened there, I give my backs to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. People say to me, how do you know the Lord had a beard? Well, they would have had a hard job plucking the cheeks if it hadn't had the beard on. And so we see that uh, they plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Listen, he took the shame. Has any of you ever suffered shame? I'll tell you. I've suffered shame and I deserve to suffer shame. He says, I didn't hide my face from shame and he had nothing to be ashamed of. He stood there for me. He stood there in my shame. He says, I hid not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I shall not be confounded. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. You see, this is the moment he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, at Calvary, this, this Calvary that we're referring to might not mean very much to some of you, but he knows that he must lay down his very life for you and for me if we're ever going to have the opportunity of being saved by God's sovereign grace. Look, friend, why am I getting excited? Please understand, he took it all for you. And when that breaks on you, and when the awareness of that breaks into your soul and your spirit, and you realize, 47 years ago I realized that my friend is sweeter as the days go by. And thank God our Lord Jesus Christ remembered a vile wretch like me and saved me by his grace. Please don't throw that away. He did it for you. He took it for you. Don't cast it off like a thing of naught. Now, no one in their right mind wants to die. And although he has a perfect human nature, yes, he's God in human form. We sometimes call him the God-man. We believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And here's the Son, and he has a perfect human nature. And everything in that nature would desire to live and not die. Yet in the garden of Gethsemane he cried, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And the blood like sweat was falling to the ground. He was willing and ready to go to death for your sake and mine. And now with the clear intention of going to his death at Calvary, at Golgotha, he sends his disciples on ahead. This is a feast time. There's loads of people all heading up to Jerusalem. There's not much room in those inns. 
and uh, he sends the disciples on ahead of him to make preparation for his overnight stay at a village belonging to the Samaritans. You know, I love to watch other people, and I learn a whole lot of things about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was no wee fella. Whenever he was walking along with the disciples there, you had no trouble knowing he's, he's the one. He's the leader. You had no trouble knowing that they were revering him. They were going ahead to make sure there was, there was preparations made for his coming. Watch it and you'll see for yourself. If you watch the reaction of the people around him, you'll learn so much about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says here in verse 52, And he sent messengers before his face, you can see his face mentioned in the previous verse, and here it is mentioned again. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. These people were Samaritans. We did tell you something. We've been over there many, many times. We have taken hundreds of people over with us and showed them all around the sites. And if you're going to go up through the center of the land, you're going to go up through Samaria. But the Jews don't do that. They have no dealings with the Samaritans. And if they're going, say, from Jerusalem to Galilee area, they'll cross the River Jordan, go up the coast of Perea, and then come back over the River Jordan when they get up there to Galilee. They won't even, they won't even tread on the same ground as the Samaritans. The Jews wouldn't do that. And uh, he sent, here's the Lord Jesus Christ making arrangements to stay the night with them. There's not an inch of racism or, or sectarianism in our Savior's bone. And there ought not to be in ours either if we're his, because we're members of his body and of his blood. But it says here they, that he sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, and they did not receive him. Do you see those very sad words. I want you to remember those words that clearly record the, the, the choice that they made that day. They did not receive him. They said, we're not letting him in here. He's not one of us. Now watch why. Because his face, and there's his face mentioned for the third time, his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now what does that mean? Well, it means, you see, do you remember the woman at the well that he talked to? And she says, you Jews, you worship God on Mount Moriah at Jerusalem. We Samaritans, we worship God on Mount Gerizim, and we have Ebal over here as well. You see, they have different places of worship. Now, you've maybe come in here tonight, and you go to a different place of worship than anything like this wee place that you're in this evening. We don't care where you go. We're not even interested in your religion. We want to tell you about Jesus. God commands all men everywhere to repent. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're red or yellow, black or white, whether you're Protestant, Catholic or Mohammed or whatever, Muslim or whatever. Friend, God wants you all to repent. This is only one Savior for all men everywhere. And so you can see that, that these people are saying, he doesn't go to our place of worship, so he's not getting in here. See? He's going to Jerusalem. And it wasn't only uh, the Jews who would have no dealing with the Samaritans, as the woman at Sychar's well said, but you can see the Jews are every bit as bad because you'll remember when they were arguing with the Savior one day, it says in John 8 and 48, then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and your demon possessed, thou hast a devil? You see? So they have that hatred in their hearts for the Samaritans as well as the Samaritans have a hatred in their heart for the Jews. Now, what a horrible blasphemy to accuse God in human form, the Lord of glory, of being demon-possessed. It's a wonder he didn't open up the ground below them and swallow them into hell there and then. But he came come to save them. He loved them. Don't misunderstand 
God's motives towards you tonight, dear unsaved one. What bigotry this is. And they're labeling him as one of the Samaritans simply because they hated him and they hated the Samaritans too. There's nothing wrong with being a Samaritan, you know. That's why the Lord told the story of the good Samaritan. They did not like that. They didn't like that. You see, there was religious bitterness and strife between them concerning the true place of worship. Are you all taken up with places of worship? And you think to yourself, I'll not be doing anything here tonight because these boys don't go to my place of worship. Forget about that. I, as a matter of fact, there's Adi, and, and, and I'm thinking about Africa, and I worked with a, a man of God who was actually just working at that time uh, because he was home on furlough and he's getting a bit of extra cash, that's all. And uh, his name was Victor Carson. Uh, he had a brother, David, and Maud was his wife, and uh, they were in the WAC mission. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting men like that. And I said to him, he, he was an elderly man now, told me many stories, and I was only a young Christian at that time. And I remember saying, look, you've been in Africa all these years, and you've come home. What would you say stands out to you the most between the two places, especially the Christians? Well, he says, in Africa, the people will come out of their mud huts and they'll leave their homes behind and they'll fall down in front of an idol and they'll worship an idol. He says, here in this country, he says, they leave their houses and they go into their idols, their churches and their chapels, and they sit inside them. And funny, that was touched this morning. Oral touched the same thing. And this was on my heart from yesterday or the week before. And uh, friend, you can be all took up with uh, the wee man in our place, great wee man. You, that's not what it's all about. If you haven't got Christ in your heart, you're on your way to hell. Does your wee man tell you that? You need to be saved. You must be born again. Now, you can see here the indignation of James and John, the sons of thunder, in verse 54. And it says here, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Lord, will we burn them alive? Will you give? You see, they couldn't call down fire from heaven. But they knew if he told them to do it, they could do it. He could do anything, and they knew it. They have lived with them for three and a half years and they know that there's nothing impossible to him. He knows everything. He can do anything. And uh, so they say, uh, we, we, would it be your will that we should call down? You see, they're still thinking about Elijah. That's why I read that about her. He, that, that man with a hairy uh, camel's hair garment and a big hairy man, that big man Elijah, they were taking this all in. And thinking, he's the boy that called down the fire. And they're thinking, now, Lord, would you want us to do that? Now, that's a strange suggestion for disciples of love and compassion and mercy to make, isn't it? You can see here that they knew that Christ was infinitely superior in power. If Elijah could do it, he could do it. Because the Lord God Almighty our great creator had told them, this is my beloved son, hear him. Don't be pulling them down to the level of Moses and Elijah. You now watch their correction. It says in verse 55 to 56, but he turned and rebuked them. Now this cut right into them. I mean, when the Lord rebuked you, you knew you'd been rebuked. And he said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Listen, I, that, that, has, that has spoken over and over again in my spirit, even to myself. You know not what manner of spirit you are of. I wonder, do the Christians in Northern Ireland know what manner of spirit we are of? The Holy Spirit, agape love, God is love, pure, unending love. I, at this time in my experience, am plunging into the ocean of God's eternal love and I'm enjoying every minute of it. And yet, all around me, 
Everything's giving way. You, I know the world we're living in. I'm not burying my head like an ostrich. I know it far more maybe than you do. But the thing is this. God loves us. Can I tell you something, Christian? Our Lord Jesus Christ cannot lie. And he taught us that God the Father loves us with exactly the same love that he loves him with. That is fantastic. That is overwhelming. That God loves me as much as he loves the Lord Jesus. Why? Because I'm dead and I'm alive in Christ. And when he looks at me, he only sees Christ. He doesn't see the old George Bates anymore that I see every morning when he opens my eyes. Oh no, friend. I want you to think of the wonderful Savior's word here. He says, the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Listen, God doesn't want to burn you. Don't you be running around thinking that God willeth the death of any because he doesn't. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He doesn't want anybody to perish. You would think sometimes uh, in our minds that, 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 that God's out to get us. Oh, dear. Where was God at Calvary when Christ was going through all that? God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. He was there on the cross. Don't be thinking harsh thoughts of God. God couldn't love you more. God so loved you. Think of the intensity of that love. For God so loved the world. Think of the immensity of that love that he gave his only begotten son. Think of the sacrificiality of that love. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, think of the infinity of the life that God wants to give you. Oh, I've got to be very careful here. The time's flying. Well, I have to get it over to you. You see that, and you've got to realize, if you will, that our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about men and women's lives here and boys' and girls' lives. He's not talking about their souls at this moment. He says, the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. You see, these are lives of men and women that can be laid down in battle, or they, they can be destroyed, or they can be cut short. In other words, their earthly lives. The Lord's talking about their earthly lives. And in chapter 19 of Luke, just three or four chapters on, you'll find in, in verse 10, the emphasis is on man's soul when our Lord Jesus Christ says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's your soul. That's his primary purpose in ever coming into this world. This defiled speck of space dust that we call earth. My friend, listen. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was his primary purpose. But here at this point, he's talking about men and women's lives. There's some people would tell you off for talking like that. And they would say, he's not interested in men and women's lives. You need to preach about hell and about heaven and that's it. That's not what this book teaches me. That's not what the book teaches me. Now I need to underline a few points before I sit down uh, to make you understand what I believe to be God's message to your soul this evening. Mankind's greatest danger, friend, is the second death at the great white throne of judgment. When they search the books, the book of life, to see if your name's there, and if it's not there, if it hasn't already been written in there before the great white throne of judgment, then you'll be taken in the vice-like grip of angelic hands and You'll be cast, do you know what cast means? Hurled headlong into the lake of fire. And you'll never get out. And you'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. There's no cessation of this torment. You see, this is the greatest danger that you're in tonight. It's a death that never dies. We have everlasting life. 
those of uh, us poor sinners who realized we needed Christ to save us or would be damned. We have everlasting life because we received him. But you'll have everlasting death. It was Peter the apostle who first asked the question to the believers of his day. He says, what shall the end be? of them that obey not the gospel of God. Now you'll get a chance at the end of this meeting to either obey the gospel of God, the call of God to you for you to come and be saved, or you will obey not the gospel of God. Well, he says, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? He's not speaking astronomically. Peter, it was Peter was inspired by God to tell us in 2 Peter chapter 3, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Hey, this man never heard anything but louder than a, a peal of thunder. He says there's going to be a big explosion. And then he says the elements will melt with fervent heat. You would think he saw those films about hydrogen bombs, wouldn't you? The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This is Peter, 2,000 years ago, talking. You know, he knows astronomically how it's going down. He's not even talking politically. He knows that the beast, the Antichrist, will rise very quickly here and take over this entire world and we'll have a cashless society in 666. He knows that he'll take over commercially and religiously and militarily and politically. He's going to be a total genius. Genius! This is the devil's superman. He knows all about it. And he knows humanity will not destroy itself ever. You see, what shall the end be, he says, of them that obey not the gospel of God? And right to the very end, the rapture we're waiting for, and then the millennial reign of Christ. You know that you're the, the tribulation period and then the millennial reign of Christ and then Christ will come with his holy angels taking vengeance on them that know not God. The great white throne of judgment will be set up. The, de the dead in hell will be raised up. And then there's a, the, the, the new heavens and the new earth. And right to the end, there'll be men and women and boys and girls on this planet. Mankind will not destroy himself. Now he'll come very near to it, very soon, in the middle of the tribulation period. But that's another story. And if it wasn't for God uh, stepping in and shortening the day and stopping this planet as it reels to and fro through space, he would succeed. But for the elect's sake, God will step in. But, but he's, not ta he's talking personally here. He's saying, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? How will it eventually end for you personally? Whenever the moment surely comes for you, when death strikes. You young people, you're, you're listening to me and you're thinking, that man's bananas, it's going to be a million years before that ever happens to me. I have buried children younger than you, many of them. I have buried children that never even made it to come out of the womb. Never even made it to the first day. I've buried children three months old. I've seen dozens of people dying, friend. Don't you be thinking that you're immune to this thing. God has arranged for you to be here tonight. And I appeal to you. You're breaking his heart. You're breaking his heart. He wants to save you so much. And it's desperately important and it's desperately urgent. Have you ever wondered how it will happen in your experience? Will it be a terminal illness or a heart attack or, or, or an accident maybe hit by a bus? Or, or, or will you be burned alive when you're sleeping some night or electrocuted or murdered? Or will it be suicide or a medical blunder? Or will you die in your old age? There's so many different ways. You know, people are planning to get saved at the 11th hour. Well, I'll tell you something. You think of all these ways of dying and I'll tell you something. 90% of the people die at half ten that are waiting to the 11th hour to get right with God. They never get the chance of a deathbed repentance. Very, very, very few. But the Savior's warning of a far worse kind of perishing than physical death when he says, and fear not them that kill the body, 
but are not able to kill the soul. Do you know that? That nobody can kill the soul. Did you know that? Our soul will last for as long as God lasts in one of two places, heaven or hell. You can't shoot it. You can't burn it. You can't knife it. You can't poison it. You can't blow it up. But Christ says, rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I remember when I wasn't long saved, I heard Sammy Workman preaching about that verse. And he said, that's God's hell. That's God he's talking about. And I thought, oh, he's right off the reel. That man, whoever he is. I got to know Sammy. We were great friends before he went to heaven. But the thing is that I'm pointing out to you, this is God we're talking about here. Fear him who destroys both soul and body in hell. It's not the devil. The devil doesn't own hell. It's God's hell. And the devil's a victim of hell. And the devil's going to be flung into hell and be tormented day and night forever and ever. Get that picture out of your mind. Satanists are telling me I'm keeping him with the devil so when I get to hell, he will let me work for him. Ha, you're back on a loser, idiot. Go and read the Bible. There's no such thing. What shall the end be? Please make sure that you register the fact that what we have here is not the end of existence. We, it doesn't all end up in a funeral and in a hole in the ground. That's not where your life ends up. But Peter is anticipating the awful appearing of your soul before God. It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, there's no reincarnation. You don't die and die and die once to die. And after this, the judgment. Peter's referring to the ferocity of that awful end. And I can almost see him wagging his head as he writes that. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? This man had spent over three years in the companionship of the all-knowing, omniscient Savior and the rest of the apostles. He knows all about this. And remember, the people that he's referring to, them that know, they, them that receive not, that obey not the gospel of God. It wasn't that they didn't know the gospel of God. They knew all about it, but they didn't obey it. They didn't want it. They refused it. Have you ever wondered what hell will be like? I know these are sober things we're thinking about, but three times in Mark chapter 9, the Lord Jesus said, The fire will never be quenched, and their worm dieth not. It'll eat and eat and eat. Your memory will eat and eat and eat forever. Forever. And some of the memories that I have met, lives that are destroyed and ruined, if they don't get saved, that worm will eat and eat and the fire will never be quenched. In other words, you just don't burn up into non-existence like a, a moth flying into a candle flame. You're going to be tormented if you're not saved. Can you be tormented and not be aware of it? Can you be tormented when you no longer exist? Don't be daft. Now, I've taken time with this because I don't want anybody to misunderstand me this evening. I know and I fully believe that the eternal benefits that are secured by the finished work of Christ for every redeemed believer far outweigh the potential joys of this present transient world that we're living in. Troubled mind. He gives us peace with God, our Creator. Do you know the only safe place in this earth at the moment? To be in the center of God's will. And that begins with trusting Christ as your Savior and becoming God's child. This world's out of control. I don't know whether you noticed it or not. I was going to say the lunatics have taken over the asylum, but you know what I'm trying to say. But he gives us Peace with God, our Creator. He settles the sin question in our lives for time and for eternity. God doesn't only forgive your sins. He says your sins and your iniquity. See those things you're ashamed of that you have done in the past. And God saw what you did in the dark. He says, I'll remember them no more. Not only will I forgive them, I'll blot them out of my head and never ever remember them again. Thank the Lord for that. 
The only place in the entire universe where you can find true peace is peace through the blood of his cross at the foot of the old blood-stained rugged cross. He gives us eternal life. We'll never perish. Neither can any power pluck them out of my hand. We have what we Christians call eternal security in Christ. So I'm not depending on me keeping anything. People say to me, oh, I would love to be saved, but I couldn't keep it. Neither can I love. I, there's no one on this planet can keep it. If there was anything to keep. But it's not the sheep that keeps the shepherd. It's the shepherd that keeps his sheep. The Lord knows you're not going to become Superman or something like that or Superwoman or sinless. He knows that. That doesn't mean we just go ahead sinning and we know that he'll forgive us. No, no, God forbid. God would know that's your motive and you know that. But if you're genuine, then you'll have to pray like me and like everybody else. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. That's a daily thing. You've got a whole wrong concept in your mind. If you're thinking, I would love to get saved, but I couldn't keep it, forget that rubbish. That's from the devil. He'll keep you. He'll bless you. He'll forgive you. He'll impute his righteousness unto you. You just, what happens when you do become a Christian? That's why you're mixed up and you're not becoming a Christian. He's going to prepare an actual place for us in heaven and he's coming very soon to take us home. Yes, I could go over all the eternal issues from now to doomsday. Excuse me, pull my trousers up here because I've lost a terrible lot of weight since I got up into this pulpit. Now, allow me to say also that I'm not propagating some sort of slick American tele-evangelist style prosperity gospel either. That's not what we believe in where all Christians are supposed to be completely healthy, extremely wealthy, and happy clappy, and they live in a bed of roses and they never have a problem. Don't you listen to that nonsense. That is total nonsense. Look at the Bible and see how these people lived. The great salvation that Almighty God wants to give us is far more wonderful and important than mere worldly prosperity and guaranteed good health and business success. That's not what salvation's about. God isn't a genie, and you just rub the bottle and he gives you three wishes. You're all mixed up if you think like that. The Savior himself said, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world if you had more money than Donald Trump ever dreamt of? What good would it do you, Christ says? If you've lost your own soul, your own soul is far more important. Do you know there's people that would pay a fortune for your lungs, for your heart? There's people who would pay a fortune tonight, rich men, women, for your kidneys. You have a lot to be thankful for. But listen, your soul is something, it's on another level altogether. And you can lose it. The quickest way to hell is just sit there and do nothing. I love to get onto the motorway. You don't have to worry about the lights or pedestrian crossings or anything. Do you know the devil's motorway to hell? Just sit and do nothing. That's the quickest way to hell. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You can go to hell without rejecting it, without refusing it, without uh, uh, despising it. None of those things. All you have to do is neglect it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Just let it drift on past you tonight. And listen, tomorrow and forevermore you could be thinking of every word you've heard in this meeting. It's almost over. I was preaching at a mission many years ago and a gentleman asked me, I was up in Opsley Hall and a gentleman asked me if I would call at his residence on the way home and speak to him before I went home to Randallstown. It transpired that he owned a very upmarket restaurant in Shaftesbury Square in Belfast at the time and he was a Muslim. Now, I didn't know anything about any of those things. But I went into his house and he was a, a lovely man, a, a gentle man and an, an elderly man. And, and he said to me, you kept saying, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I says, that's right. He says, escape what? Escape what? I don't understand what you're talking about. 
And I was so touched by his kindly humility to be asking the like of me what this meant that I've never forgot that man, ever. I never will. But I remember explaining the gospel to him, and I took a lot more time than the two or three seconds I'm mentioning him in just now. And, and I remember telling him, it's how shall we escape the calling down of the divine displeasure upon our ungodly heads? In other words, the wages of sin's death. You see, it's not all water under the bridge. Somebody's got to pay for all that you've done. If you're not going to do it, then you've got to let the Lord Jesus Christ take your place. There's always a price to pay, and that price must be paid. I said, sir, how can we escape the condition of dying in our sins? Do you know what the Lord says? He says, if you don't believe that I am he, then you'll die in your sins. And he says, you shall die in your sins, and listen, whether I go, you cannot come. Don't tell me you go to purgatory for a few thousand years, and then you'll come, then you'll make him a liar. He says, where I am, you cannot come. I'm telling you, friend, you'll never be there. There's no purgatory. Christ says, if you don't believe now, then you can't come to where I am forever. How shall we escape the coming judgment of the great white throne? I haven't time at two or three minutes past eight to go into any of these things. How shall we escape the consequences of eternally experiencing the horrific torments of hell? What's hell like, you say? Listen. If you open your eyes in hell tonight, do you know the first thing that you'll remember? I didn't believe this place existed. And you'll know now there is a hell. There really, really is a hell. And you'll have nothing under your feet or above you or below you or on any side but blazing, burning fire, eternal fire. And then you'll say to yourself, there is a hell and I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to get out of it. What have I done? And the most horrific horror of them all in hell is to realize that the gracious, merciful, compassionate, loving, oh, if only you knew what's in my heart just now, but if only you knew what's in his heart just now, it's full of love for you, who did everything that he could to save you. It's the most horrible horror in hell to know that he has washed his hands of you forever because you turned your back on God and his salvation. Oh, listen. There's no escape. There's no hope of it ever. There's no way out because there's a great gulf fixed. Friend, you've been very gracious and I've got to just get over in two minutes what the message is. Now listen to me. It's a greatly misunderstood aspect of the gospel that Christ and his great salvation relates to mankind's here and now, not only to this day and age, but to each and every individual listening to my voice and their immediate circumstances. When you see a drunkard who has destroyed his own liver or a harlot who's diseased with AIDS, or the smoker with lung cancer, or the drug addict with their destroyed brain cells racking their lives, let me say something to you. The Lord doesn't look down his nose at those people. It breaks his heart. It breaks the very heart of God to watch the untold suffering that they're going through without him being able to be there for them, to love them, to save them, to deliver them, to protect them, to, to provide for them and lift them out of the gutter and the scrap heap of life as he did with a drunk and a vile monster like me. Try to understand the love of God. I can't preach it. I'm no good at this. But this is God's message tonight. Those people had no time for him. They, they said, no, we're not receiving him. He's not coming here. Do you know what he did the next minute when the disciples got it wrong? He stood up for them. He stood up for the people that had rejected him. 
He just goes on loving you and loving you and loving you. How many times have you seen it? Have you known it in your own life? I remember my life became a living hell and I was, I was driven by the spirit of fear and deep oppression that I hope you'll never understand. Fear hath torment. And I used to wonder, was there a curse on me or something? I didn't know the curse of the broken law was on me and that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to realize the devastating effect that sin has on your everyday existence as well as on your eternal soul. And my time is gone. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to play on you tonight. Listen, I thought to myself, I've made my bed in hell and I'm not even dead yet. And I'm going to have to lie in it. Hallelujah. I haven't been lying in it. For the 47 years that have just passed by, God has given me peace that passes all understanding. He has blessed us. He has loved us, my wife, my family, and the Savior's messages for this present moment for you. He actually preached to the woman and said to her, uh, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. That's not in heaven. That's an earthly thing. He preached in the synagogue at Nazareth to the beggar, to the brokenhearted, to the bondaged, to the blinded, to the bruised, and there's none of them in heaven. These are earthly things, and I meant to go on and talk about earthly things, but friend, listen, be sure your sin will find you out. There are millions of people, fallen creatures on this planet, some of them big executives, some of them looking as if they're having the time of their lives. And they all signed up recently to a website on the internet for all varieties of illicit sex. Be sure your sin will find you out. Of course, they were told as always, you can trust us to be discreet. This is completely confidential. No one will ever know. <laughs> the whole world knows. Millions of them. Wrecked marriages. Ruined minds, asylums full. All because of one website. That's nothing. But I'm just pointing out to you that your sin will cost you everything if you don't come to the Lamb of God, if you don't come to the Savior now. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you. Let's just bear our hearts before the Lord and take this opportunity, please. How do I know he's here? Because he cannot lie and he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He was poor, you know. He had nowhere to lay his head. And yet he has come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He was in captivity. That's why he can set people free. They bound him in the garden. He was blinded. They blindfolded him and hit him and asked him, prophesy, who hit you? They pierced his brow with a crown of needle-like thorns and beat it and he was bruised as they savagely started on him at Gabbatha's pavement. He was brokenhearted as he hung between heaven and earth and endured hell. He says, reproach has broken my heart. And God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Listen, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And with his stripes we're healed. Will you come now? He set this meeting up for you. He's calling you. Are you going to go out of those doors with it written across your head as far as your response in heaven is recorded? They would not receive him. I beg you, understand, the Lord loves you with such an avalanche of love that I could never put it into words. Don't see him as an enemy. He died for you. He rose again. He's alive. He's here. He's holding out his nail-pierced hand. 
grasp it by faith. Say, Lord, forgive me and save me. And never be ashamed of them. Never be ashamed to confess that you're a Christian. Tell somebody before you go home that you've got saved. Heavenly Father, you know that I just can't get this dynamite into a matchbox and I pray you'll forgive me. And I thank thee for giving the people grace to sit. And I pray, Lord, tonight, save a precious soul. Lord, you know we can almost see the flames of hell and hear the cries of torment. But, oh God, there's going to be a wonderful redeemed of the Lord in heaven because of the precious blood of the Lamb. Wash souls in that blood tonight. Make them clean forevermore. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, it's a quarter past eight.